Right, well, I'll just, I'll start. Um, as I'm sure if you've, if you've seen my YouTube videos, you know that I use cheap brushes. Um, if, you're, if you're painting um, for the first time, one of the things that people do find quite important is the cost. So uh, I went out and I bought a, a few spares today. These cost um, very little, they're incredibly cheap and um, you can get them almost anywhere and they'll, they'll last a long time if you clean them properly. And also the other thing I always say this is that um, regarding cleaning I don't use turpentine, uh, I use um, just detergent, just the type, sort of detergent that you would use in your washing machine. And um, when you buy a brush like this, I'll just do this very quick. I will paint in a second, I promise. That's why you're here. But um, when you buy a brush like this in the shop, a lot of people, when they want to see whether the bristles come out, they do this. Don't do that, because that wastes time. Do this. Just do that. And the loose bristles will fly out like little rockets. And I've already tested these. So that's a good brush to go. And um, the paint that I'm going to use is uh, basically... A very limited palette. Let me just get that hair off there. I've got sap green, red ochre, there's a bit of yellow ochre, and that's just for later on, I won't use much of that. And this disgusting looking stuff here is alkyd, which is a, a resin based medium. These are, these are oil paints, and this is not oil, this is resin, but this can be mixed with oil paints. Here we go, a lot of this sap green, red ochre. What I usually do is I put a little bit more red on one side, a bit more green on the other. And the reason I do that is um, there's no, there's no, this isn't sort of something that it, only I do. This is something that a lot of painters will do. Just a quick reminder again, that's what I'm going to try and do. There's lots of ways of starting an oil painting. Um, I'll just run through a few. When you, have, when you go to classes, quite often, uh, it's not what you'll be taught by a lot of teachers. It depends on where you learn to paint and the method that you learn to paint. And I was taught to paint in the classical style. Now, I hope you can see this bit here. This, is, this represents the ground area of the painting. And this here is a really quick way to paint a tree. I'll show you what you mustn't do. What you mustn't do when you paint a tree is you don't want to do this and then paint bits on the tree. It won't have any life in it. It won't look like a tree. It'll look like a lollipop. Everybody goes through this. If you want a tree to look, how, look as though it's got a bit of life in it, what you need to do is add life. And the way you add life is the spontaneity of your brush stroke. You notice here that I'm letting the red come off the brush as well as the green. Green one side, red the other. So I've put a little bit of red in there and I want to add now a little bit of light. And the way that you add light with this style is exactly the way that Constable and Turner would have done it, and that is to wipe it. And what's the colours you're using? Yes, the, the colours I'm using are sap green and red ochre at the moment, although eventually I will be using a bit of blue. One, one of the things I like to do in my uh, videos is to show people how to relax so that you won't see any careful structuring of a painting what you see like that. You mustn't be afraid of the paint. And it looks like a mess to start with, but you know the saying, you have to break eggs to make omelettes. So let the blue touch the green of the trees. Basically, attack the paint. Don't be afraid of it. Make as much mess as you can. Make some accidents. You notice how I'm pushing the green and the blue together here with a brush? I'm not particularly uh, 
worried about what it'll look like at the moment because I know it'll be okay. So any ideas you've had about painting in the past, I hope that by now I've completely demolished them. Here's a bit of brown on the blue that I've just carefully, uh, carefully, as I, that I've just applied to the painting. So I'm going to add a little bit of something in the sky. It's exactly the same brown that's on the ground, but you notice, I hope you can see, because the, the camera is quite high definition, it'll start to look like a sort of pinky colour in the corner there. And that's exactly the same dark brown that's used here. And you notice they don't look dirty together, they, they actually look in harmony. And I'll, I'll get into the reasons why these things harmonise, uh, either later in a question time or, um, or on another video. But it, in a nutshell, it's all to do with values, values of colours. I've got a bit of medium here, that's the alkyd I'm using, a little bit of medium on the corner there, and I'm just going to push it down into this gap here. I, I really hope I'm staying out of the way for this one. I know that I am bad with getting in the way. Okay, so I've put a bit of medium there. That's quite, quite sloppy and drippy sort of paint. And the reason I've done that is that I can get a little bit of paper and I'll run through the different types of... Uh, there's three ways of using paper. Is it one, one, two, three... No, there's four ways of using paper. This is one of them, where you make it look like a, 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 a sort of stump. And that, if you do this really tight so that it's, it's really solid, you have control over it. So I can push that in there and add a bit of light to the horizon. This is, um, this is exactly what Turner and Constable used to do, except, of course, they didn't use kitchen paper because um, they hadn't invented it. There we are, so I can add a nice bit of light to, to the horizon. Now, this light colour is a mixture of blue and white, but also the white of the board showing through. That means that if I get another colour, like, let's say, for instance, I want to... Um, it's going to be a little bit different from the original because I'm going, to, I'm going to sort of play around a bit. I've got a little bit of yellow ochre there on my hand, just on my finger. If I add the yellow ochre there, I can add a new colour to the sky without it mixing too much with the green and going in, turning into a bright green. So all I'm doing there is just putting in a little bit of, sort of a golden glow in the sky. I can sort of spread the yellow ochre a little bit across there. I'm not going to do it the other side. I've got plans for the other side. And it will be slightly different. So while this is in a very loose state, I'm just turning around to have a look at my camera, see what you're seeing. OK, that's good. If I now get a brush and I take off most of the paint, and again, no turpentine, all I do is wipe the brush because I like the paint to be left on the brush. The reason why uh, some paintings work and some don't, it's to, it's to do with harmonisation of, harmonization of colour. So when you have in the green a little bit of the blue, and in the blue you have a bit of the green, and in the darks you also have some of the other colours, it means that the colours are all harmonising. It's like a song, where all the tones in the song all sort of mingle together. So now, if I, if I put my brush here and I start pushing into the, into the sky there, I can get a feeling of perspective there. Perspective is one of the easiest things that you can paint. It's just that people think it's difficult, and it isn't really. So I'm going to, using this piece of paper, I'm just going to get some white. I've got some white, white just there. I'm just going to add that also to the horizon, just a little bit there. Now, I'm going to, before I do too much more, I'm going to show you a few little tricks with paper. I'm going to darken the foreground.
Now then, um, so this is a basic simple shape of some trees here. And I'm going, I'm going to attempt to um, zoom in a bit. OK, right, I've zoomed in just a little bit there because I want to show you something else. Um, when people paint trees, often they'll find something like a dark brown. And uh, because they have this idea that tree trunks are, are dark brown. In fact, they're not dark brown. They, they can be white, uh, yellow. They can give the appearance of a dark brown, greyish colour, particularly when there's light behind them. But when there's dark behind them, like this, I'm just going to add a bit more, a little bit more dark in there, I think. Just chuck in a bit of that. I'm going to also use, oh, the other colour that I use sometimes is Payne's Grey. I'm just going to add a bit of Payne's Grey. Just making sure my hand is out of the way. I'm just going to put some Payne's Grey there. Not a lot, just a little bit. And the reason I've done that is because if you then take a piece of paper and you screw it into a really tight taper like this, you'll be amazed. Um, but anyway, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to show you how to do tree trunks here. I'm just going to make the foreground in front of the tree lighter, like so. When you do this, by the way, if you use a piece of paper, use one, one surface. Once you've done that, find another clean bit of paper because if you just keep doing this, you will end up just uh, making a mess. Every time you touch the board, it needs to be a clean piece of paper, like so. Now, um, this is obviously an area in front of the tree where light is hitting it. If you want tree trunks against a dark background, which will give you the effect of quite a complex image, if you look at that, I'm going to try and get that closer to the camera. You notice the, these tree trunks here and here, this one. And all this texture, it looks it looks complicated. Um, Hang on a second. So, um, but it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Deep breath. And um, uh, I'm going to do the tree trunks that I promised you ages ago. Nice bit of light there. The thing I'm trying to get over to you is um, that if you approach a painting really carefully and, and to the point where you've almost got your hand resting on the board because you don't want to make a movement in the wrong direction, that's, that's where you could be going wrong. You have to make mistakes. Um, I'm going to demonstrate that in a minute by putting um, something here that I don't want. I mean, okay, so I did this little explosion here. Uh, that, that's an error. So, you know, if you make an error, who cares? Um, it's just a painting. Now, if I, if I wipe that away from the picture, like that, you see it's turned into a green smudge. If I wipe it a bit harder, it's turned into a, a, a less violent green explosion type thing. If I put a bit of blue on it, hey, wouldn't it be great if house paint had the same covering ability as this stuff? You see, it's gone. So, if you make a mistake, uh, don't worry about it, because it's only a mistake, and we learn through mistakes. You wouldn't believe the amount of videos that I've made that you lot will never see, because something went drastically wrong. I'm lying, of course, I don't make mistakes. So anyway, um, going back here, tree trunks, what's this? Magical tree trunks, here we go. Because this is thin, and it wanders as I touch the board, it will make nice meandering shapes. Okay, don't try and do anything too precise with them. I'm just looking around trying to find some paper. The paper towels are to the side of you there. Yeah, oh, that's what I want down there. So I'm going to get, um, oh, while I'm fiddling around with the paper, you can also use these things. And uh, in England, they're cute. Um, Q tips. No, in America, they're oh. Q tips. In England, they're cotton buds. And some people call them earbuds, but of course you should never put them in your ear. A doctor said to me once, uh, the biggest thing you should stick in your ear is your elbow. And I said, well, yeah, but you can't. And he said, quite. Of course you can't. You shouldn't do it. So don't stick them in your ear. Use them for painting. Much more satisfying. There we go. You notice uh, I, you can do that once and that's it. That's technically had it. Notice the paint on the end there. The other thing, as I'm, putting these, as I'm putting these tree trunks in, 
the other thing you want to get in your painting is movement. Now, movement is an interesting thing to explain. It's, it's having the ability to paint a sky and look as though the wind is just moving it across your painting or that the, you've got a tree and it's just bending in the wind. Um, so that, that's the nearest way, that's probably the only way I can explain it. I can show it better than I can explain it. And that is by this. Just getting another bit of paper here. Screwed up like so. Slightly thicker one this time. So I'm going to put a main, a main tree trunk in there and I think it should probably be here. Starting on the light patch where I've wiped it and pushing up, I'm going to have a sort of main one there. And they can, of course they can cross, they can cross each other. If it doesn't look right, which that doesn't, just put a bit of paint back over it, like so. And then um, try and cotton bud again. So the movement that I'm trying to get is like a bend this way. I want to give the feeling that the wind over the years has pushed the trees that way and they've got this sort of kink in them. Like the sort of trees you see as you approach the sea, uh, they all have a certain lean and it's usually away from the sea. That's where the predominant wind comes from. So these are, these have definitely got wind coming from the left. And those are at the moment the main trunks. So I'm just going to put in a few tiny little touches like this. Now, some people have said to me, well, that's not painting. Well, of course it's painting. It's, it's, I'm using an alternative brush. If you get, if I had paint on my hands and just slapped it on there, I'm still painting. So you don't have to, uh, you don't have to go out and buy a really expensive brush and feel that you're, you know, you've spent thousands of pounds or dollars getting all the latest equipment. It won't make you a better painter. If you want to do it, you can use your nose. As long as you get the paint, from the palette to that in some form, uh, that's a painting. Anyway, going back to what I was saying earlier, Constable and uh, Turner, a couple of my favourite artists, uh, they used all kinds of things. If you, if you know Constable's paintings and you go and you look at them in like the National Gallery in London, You'll, you stand there and you think, wow, all that detail, all that texture. Well, he didn't, he didn't tickle it with a little tiny brush. On exhibition day at the Royal Academy, all the artists would have been there doing a final bit of fiddling, but most of the work would have been done prior to that. And the, the way they do it is like this. They would get a rag. Of course, I'm not going to use rags. I used to when I was a student. In fact, when I was a student, it was so long ago, I don't think we even had this stuff. We had toilet paper, but we didn't have this stuff for the kitchen. I think it was quite a trendy thing to have, have a paper towel in your kitchen. So. If you roll it up and you make all nice bumpy textures all over it like so. So I showed you the, the taper way, that was the first way. This is the second way of using paper, okay? according to the list of Stuart Davis. The reason I'm doing that is I want this to be textured. If I touch that now, you will see, I hope, if the camera is doing what it's supposed to. I'm going to put leaves in there now. Instant leaves. At first, they are just in the colour of the board that is showing through. But if you look at that now, you've got, a, you've got a dark area under the trees, you've got the trunks in the front, and you've got an overhang coming over with the leaves in this area here. So I can also do these textures down the bottom here. I'll be doing more work on the top of the tree in a minute. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to show you how to get sort of grassy effects down here. And to do that, though, I need to move some of these brushes out the way because it's an extremely violent technique. So I'm just getting a bit more green down there. I just want some solid, solid colour there to work in. Uh, you, you may notice also, um, I wonder if you can see it, I just need to, um, this dark area down the bottom, I'm just adding a bit more paint to it because I want to uh, I want to whip it. So I've got again my paper, making it into a taper like so. Now grass. When you go out, uh, if you are a, a plein air painter and you go out and you're painting a view, 
you may think, well, I'm going to paint some grass. What do you do? How do you paint grass? The thing about grass is it's extremely small stuff, particularly in, uh, well, Europe. Uh, I think there's some places in the jungle where grass is actually really quite big, but the sort of grass I'm talking about is the sort of grass you would see you know, in a, in a tonalist landscape like this. I'm just going to just do something at the base of that tree there a bit, because I'm not quite happy with that. There we are. Um, grass, yeah. If you go out and stand in your garden and you look at grass that's actually, you know, three or four feet in front of you, it's really small stuff. So you can't, you can't realistically paint every blade, unless you're one of these painters that wants to ba paint minute detail of everything, that's fine. Um, if you're young and you start early, and uh, you know you'll have plenty of time to do it. But if you, if you, if you're not into hyper detail and you just want to get a feeling in a picture, you want to get the textures and everything over quite quickly. So grass. Here we go. The quick way to paint grass. Now again, this is something that uh, the old masters would have done. Now I will zoom in in a moment, and you'll be able to see it a little bit clearer. Um, it's like uh, anything you do with paper. You can only use the paper or the cotton bud or the Q-tip for a brief moment because they get, once they get paint on them, you've got to ditch them. Uh, if you don't and you just keep using it, that's where mud comes from. See what I mean about the violence? Yes. Okay, I'm going to zoom in. Particularly if I go over here, this area here, and I just do it on white, you can see what happens. You get some interesting grassy tones and shapes, like so. So what I'm doing, though, down here is I'm beating away at it to take the paint off. The paint is coming off onto the paper, so it's leaving the grass pale. This means that when this is dry, all I have to do is get a small brush, or um, uh, a big brush with a lot of paint and do a glazing uh, layer over the top. When, this, Of course, this has to be completely dry. I could say, well, I want yellow on there. I want the grass to be yellow. So I would paint a big yellow stripe across there, and then I would use paper and wipe away the bits, trying to find the light areas so that they will stand out even more. So you don't have to paint another blade of grass ever again. When you've got your blades of grass going up and down, don't forget, grass doesn't just do up and down. Nature is extremely disorganised. So you need to swipe sideways a few times because grass falls over. Now then, what else should we do? Uh, put a thumb up if you want to see a bit of sky work. This is where we find out whether my microphone is still working. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad you're all still there and listening. That's great. OK, so I'm going to zoom the camera back. I've got a little surprise for you, because what you thought was that I would just be painting this little picture. But in fact, what I'm going to do really fast is show you how to turn this little area, because this is a tiny part of the actual board that I've got here. I'm going to zoom out and you'll see the whole board in a minute. So I'm going to show you how quickly you can turn this into a bigger picture. Now, it won't, it won't be a highly finished thing, but it will look OK. I hope so, anyway. Uh, and let me just... I'm just look, turning around, looking in my viewfinder here, looking to see what, what I'm going to do next. Yeah, I just want to add a little bit more... a bit more leafery on the tree up there. So, and again, this, this also works... Uh, what I was saying about the grass, where you beat away the paint and you expose the light colour. It's the same with the leaves, you see. I've got these, this nicer overhang of leaves there. Um, so I could just uh, put another tone on top of that when it's dry and then wipe off to expose the light areas. You see what I mean? So this dark bit here, this dark bit will stay the same. So if you imagine I put um, uh, another a colour that I use quite often, although I don't have it here, is, it's just called light green and um, there's no mystery to it. It's exactly what it says on the label. It's light green and it's perfect for distant grass and distant leaves. Now these are quite pale here, but I might want other colours on them. So if I paint light green right across that when it's dry, 
I can then wipe away to expose the dark areas and wipe away a little bit on the light areas but leave some of the new, new colour on top. So you'll have dark, you'll have this light green and you'll have lighter green. So they all work together. The other thing I can do is when these, well, of course, again, when it's dry, think of this as your drawing. When it's dry, I can add white to the trunks in a few patches and they will suddenly become birch trees. And um, I, I, I have a feeling that you are all going to end up coming back. So when you do come back, um, again, as I said earlier, free, uh, I'll show you how to turn these into birch trees. It's actually very, very easy. Uh, now, someone, someone called me up on this. I keep saying, oh, this is all very easy. You can do this. It's all very easy. Well, I've, I've done it a long time, but that's actually not a lot to do with it. Um, painting is, I think, 96% feeling, and I was always bad at numbers, and 4% technique. <laughs> I can't believe I can't do that. Anyway, yeah, so it numbers. That's why I'm a painter, you see, I can't do numbers. I really wanted to be an accountant, but there you go. So I'm just softening the edge of the trees here before I get to the sky. By doing that, you see, I don't, I don't have to actually, I don't have to paint any leaves. You see, um, if you, if you, if you were standing here in this field, oh, I'm going to zoom back a bit for you. Okay, I'm talking about. right. If you were standing here and you were looking at this view, you wouldn't see every leaf. If you go and I don't know where you're living, but if you look out your window and you've got a tree that say, um, I don't know, 200, 200 yards or. 200 meters from where you're living. Just glance at the tree and tell me how many leaves you can see. You see my point that you can't see them all, you just see the effect that the leaves give you. So that's what I'm doing, that's what tonalism is all about. And in fact, even the old masters, when you look at some of their paintings of high, highly detailed landscapes, you get up close and look at them, it's not there, it's an illusion. Hence um, the illusion of detail. That's what you're after, just the feeling. So sky, okay, so I've done this little bit of grass here. We've got a sort of muddyish, well, it could be mud or it could be that uh, particular weed that just goes to a reddish brown at a certain time of the year. I have no idea what it's called, but I think it's called the reddish brown weed, which is what we've got growing right through there. Now you, you may see that, okay, that little light area there these little things, you see, they build up over time. That little thing there was just a touch of the paper. And if I move along just below this tree and just do it again there, I can add a tiny little sparkle to the tone without having to even... I haven't touched a brush for... I don't know. I've been, this is all mostly done with paper. So you can, you can add these little things. I call them twinklies. Little twinklies. Add a twinkly or two to your painting. Like here, I'm not totally happy with that area, just there. I quite, I quite like this side because it's going off into a mist, like it's receding from us. And I can, I can get that effect more in a few moments, and I'll show you that soon. Um, but here, there's something in that bit there that I'm not totally happy with. And I think it's this line here. Um, I, I guarantee, by the way, if you don't paint like this, you will, you will start to observe nature and notice things slightly differently. You'll, you'll, uh, I think everyone gets this, and I, you know, I've, obviously I've done this for, well, uh, half a century now. Um, but I still, as I'm driving around, I look at the world around me, particularly landscapes, and I see it in its simplest form. In other words, I see blue, dark, light, dark. And I do that automatically, and you'll find that you will do this too. You'll look at landscapes, keep your eyes on the road though, um, get out the car and have a look. And, you, and you, you'll find it fascinating, I hope, that you will start to break things down. And suddenly, one day, it's like, it's like when you start to ride a bicycle. You suddenly do it without thinking. It just happens and you can suddenly ride the bike. And exactly the same with painting. You see, now that, that was too dark. 
Now, I hope, uh, I'm not sure whether you can see it. Uh, it'll be better on the video, obviously. But, um, that was too hard, so I'm just softening it. Don't. Uh, uh, oh, the other thing, I must tell you this. Always know when to step back. It's a great temptation when you're painting to do things like this. Oh, I don't like that bit. I'm going to work on that. I'll keep working on this. Yeah, I'm really into that now. I'm pushing it around. And what you end up with over there, see, lots of pushing around, just turns into a blur. There's nothing going on there. You just point it so I know where we are. You can actually see, yes. This bit here, it's just got a nothingness about it. It suddenly turned into a, an area of the planet that has no contrast. Uh, the thing that the eye really is drawn to is contrast. So you'll see now, if I decide to build up a bit of the foreground here, you notice I do this a lot. Great skill. It takes a lot of skill to be able to twitch your hand like that. Uh, not everything I say is serious, by the way. Um, but the reason I do it is because I like the element of surprise that comes into the painting when you do that. I'm just going to move the camera, brace yourselves, just so you can see that side a little bit more. See that? Just a, tw uh, just a touch. Just a few. And, and sometimes when you leave the white of the board, you know, you want to paint snow. I mean, there's a bit of snow there on the edge. So there's snow, OK? Um, now, what I was going to do, oh yeah, I'm going to just work on that a minute and just turn that into a, a, like a bank of trees that are gradually subsiding. So to do that, I'm, I've got a paper palette down here. So I'm just sort of taking some paint off the brush just to make it so it's not quite so strong. And I'm just going to make these trees look as though they're receding into the distance down over there, like so. Yep, I could, I could cope with a walk along there. You wouldn't believe how much paper there is in this room now. It's got paint all over it. It does get everywhere. OK, so I'm going to put a bit more light on the ground, just at the base of those trees, just a tiny amount. So yeah, perspective. Things in the foreground are darker and more crisp. Things that recede away from you become blurry, and uh, the colours also uh, become muted uh, because of the um, effect of dust particles in the atmosphere. It's just one of those things. It's everywhere. Thank goodness. Um, OK, so the sky. Just going to show you a little trick with the sky. At the moment, the sky is a complete mess. Now, if you want the sky to start to be exciting, all you do is you choose an area. For instance, the trees here, it's slightly dark, just there. So a bit of light sky. Notice I'm keeping moving the paper so that I'm only offering up reasonably clean paper. A little bit of light sky next to a dark bit of landscape. It, it causes the eye to jump. And it's, um, this is worth remembering if you're going to paint tonalist pictures, or even impressionists, the impressionists did this as well, um, what works is this. Now, this is blue here. It's not a dark blue. But tonally, compared to the other blues, it's, a dark, it's the darkest blue on the painting at the moment. If I add uh, another blue, I can get it much darker. But at the moment, that bit there is, is dark. There's a bit over on the other side, but you can't see that moment. But you will in a moment. The way it works is this, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light. Working across, dark, light, dark, light. And then you've got all these tree trunks, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, etc. All the way across, so it works both ways. Once you get that um, effect hitting the viewer's retina, it actually excites the brain. It makes the painting uh, more look atable. And I'll, sh in fact, I'll show you a painting if I can reach it. Um, bear with me one second. I might be able to just reach across. Okay, so here's one I did this morning. <laughs> Hang on, I'm going to zoom out so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, 
So here's one I did uh, before breakfast. Uh, I'm kidding, of course. This is um, something I did a few months back, and there is a video of this. Uh, but you see what happens when you paint a landscape. It becomes interesting. I mean, the sky, maybe people like skies, but you see what, what makes this interesting down here is the contrasts between, you know, you've got a, the bluish distant stuff, which are, incidentally, I should say, just made out of brush strokes. There's nothing, uh, there's no fancy painting in there. So we've got it again, we've got uh, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, and then mostly dark. The bit that really gets people in this is that streak of light through the landscape. We've got, I can hear sounds. Yeah, uh, Sean said that it reminds him of the Downs in Sussex. That's exactly what I was recalling in my mind when I painted it. Is I, I was blessed with a slightly eidetic memory which means that, first of all, I can't remember numbers. Uh, I, I can commit poems to memory, but one thing I can do, and I've always been able to do it, is look at a view, and of course I grew up in Sussex, so I'm not going to have a problem with Sussex, um, and I can recall almost every scene that I've ever looked at, which is very useful, because I could just sort of project it onto my surface and then paint it. So that, that does make it a little bit easier. However... Uh, you don't have to be able to do that. What you, what you need to do to get into a painting, to make a painting exciting, is not be afraid to experiment. Once you start getting into all these sort of details, as you build up something like this, it doesn't hurt just to sit back every, every now and then and just look at it and put yourself in front of that scene and say to yourself, OK, well, I'm standing here. What am I seeing? I'm seeing a, a, a bunch of trees. Uh, not everyone is um, uh, captured by clumps of trees uh, the way I am. I, I, I've always found them interesting and slightly mystical. Um, but I look at it and I think, well, you know, once I've got to this fa stage, which is very, very loose, I have to say, this is, this, there's, absolutely, this isn't a, there's no detail in this, even though it may look detailed. And I look at it and I think, what would make that even more interesting, you know? Don't be in a hurry to say, right, that's finished. Look at it and then say, well, at the moment, you see, these leaves all around here all appear to be in front of, of the tree trunks. Why are the, why are the tree trunks... Um, I beg your pardon, I'll start again. The tree trunks appear to be really in front of everything. I get it right. Wouldn't it be more interesting if occasionally the bit of tree trunk was just blocked out like that? And then suddenly, your picture will have a little bit more depth because you're, you're with literally a touch of the brush. You don't have to sort of sweat over it, just a touch. You're putting a leaf or a clump of leaves in front of the tree trunk, which is exactly what you get in nature, like that. There's, there's, no, there's no anguish in it. It's just, uh, does that look good? No. If it does look good, stop. If it doesn't look right, walk away for a few seconds. Work on another part of the picture when you're happy and you've had time to think about it, go back to it and then you'll see the things that are wrong. For instance, I can see something I don't like along that line of trees there. It's, sort of, it's uh, quite interesting, I suppose. But you could just add one small bit of dark in there. Because why not? See, nature's not organised. The only, the, only <laughs> the only bit of nature that's organised is in a public park or your garden. The rest of it, it's, it's wild out there, I'll tell you. OK, so I'm going to uh, just check the camera angle and then I'm going to show you how to extend this over the whole picture and then I'll get onto the sky. So I could cut this out with a saw or I could do this. I could say, well, I'm going to make it a bigger picture. I'm going to go over there and I'm going to do this and I'm going to put that there and then I'm going to do this. I'm going to put a ridge across there. These are tricks that you can use. The ridge, a dark ridge here, you see, takes you across the painting. Hopefully, anyway. A bit more gloopy stuff. Lots and lots. See how quickly you can do something like this and get an interesting effect? Just imagine, if you've spent your life painting, worrying how to paint grass, and you and struggling also with 
what to put in your landscape. What do I put in it? How do I make it interesting? What you do is you disconnect your brain for a second. So a little bit of um, Payne's grey on that, just for a bit more dark there. And it's a sort of greyish, it's a, a fascinating colour. But it's... Um, if, if, you're, if you're driving around and you look at fields, uh, not the sort of tailored sort of fields that you get where it's just like a, a, a green crop. When you have a field that maybe they're just cutting grass up for cattle and stuff, you know, to, to make hay bales and whatever, all kinds of things grow in that field and the colours are quite, um, quite out of this world. There's never a completely flat field. So you see there, I could sort of let's put, a, let's put a bush there just to give that somewhere to go behind. In other words, this then starts to help build up the perspective. So I've got one here, and I've got one here, and that in the middle. If I make something more of this and more of that, I can focus the viewer into that point there. So I'm going to do that. In fact, I'll put some sky on there first, because I, uh, I want a bit of clean blue there. But I'll show you what I mean here. If I put... If I can find the plate that's got the paint on it. This is the part of a painting where it starts to get really really fun because you can just you can just let go and it, it doesn't even matter if you you know make a mis mistake at this point because you know okay there's a mistake I've just made a deliberate mistake for you you may not see it you may not notice it but to me it's a bit of a mistake just that little bit of dark so just do that and it's gone I'm going to. I could do. So we'll just, if we're going to the sky, we'll Let me just see how much foreground you can see. I'm going to be on the sky in a moment, so I'll, I'll show you the whole picture in a minute. But uh, what I'm going to do next is the sky. Once I've got a bit more sky here, I will bring this tree thing up to try and get try and get you to focus in that area. So this, okay, let's go on straight with the sky. Um, a dirty brush, it's just got blue on it and it's got a few bits of green and all kinds of stuff, but it doesn't matter. And the palette I'm going to use, you may think, oh, I could never use that because the blue's got green under it and uh, it'll contaminate it, but trust me, it won't. So I'm going to get some um, uh, Alkid from another palette. Again, quite... Um, you see, it's gone. The green that was on there is absorbed by the blue. That's one of the beauties of uh, oil paint, is the colouring, uh, the covering power that it has. And um, covers a multitude of sins. So, again, you notice I'm carefully applying the paint. Now, you get a hair in it, you, can't, you may not see it, there's a hair. If you get a hair, and with a cheap brush, you are, you are going to get a few that come out. There's one there. Don't go picking it off with your hand. Uh, you'll end up with paint all over your hand. Just use the corner of the brush, touch it like that, and there's your hair sticking up here. Right. The sky. The sky, for me, can't just be blue. It's got to have a little bit of that in it. And I'm going, I'm going as fast as I can here just so that we can get on with the q and A. I I hope, I hope you're all happy to hang around. It is the weekend, after all. What else have you got to do? OK, so there we are. I've just chucked a load of bluish grey on the top there. There's another hair that goes gone. OK. A sky... A sky is not a sky. Of course, I'm speaking for myself. If it's just blue with white fluffy clouds. I'm not going to bother over there too much. I'm going to concentrate here. So I've put this weird colour. I'm going to have a nice dark bit by the horizon. There. He said, desperately trying to keep out of the way. Now, I want to get that on there quickly. There we are. You know that sort of effect you get when the sky looks as though it's just coming in contact with the ground? Particularly when it's next to a bit of light like that, there. that really brings that out. Starts starts to make it zing a little bit. Okay, okay so, so palette knife. 
nothing special. It's just so. Again, uh, as you can see, I'm just uh, I'm taking extreme care. Skies. Okay, how many of you actually, you can tell me in a minute, sat in front of a painting and thought, oh God, now I've got to paint the sky. How am I going to paint the sky? Well, this will solve all your problems. A lot of teachers won't tell you this. And I'll tell you why they won't tell you, because they want you to come back next week so that they can reveal the mystery. So the mystery is now revealed. There we are. There's some, there's some clouds. Right? Now, don't worry, I haven't quite finished yet. When you get the big brush again and you skim over these clouds, they will become more realistic clouds and will actually start to soften down like so. Uh, in, a, in a normal painting, there's no way um, on earth that I would make the clouds follow the contour of a lump of trees. The clouds uh, will go their own way, they'll go behind it, and in fact I'll do that when I finish the painting off. But I think now we're approaching the time when I'm going to sit there and you can ask me some questions. Um, you can ask me anything you like. The only thing that's off bounds is my bank account number. Okay. Right, I'm just going to get the paint off me and then I'm going to come over there and talk to you when I find the big roll of. Oh, it's next, next to my feet. Okay. So, um, if you have a question, what I would ask everyone to do so that everyone's not talking at the same time and we don't have that um, the pictures coming in and out, you can use the raise your hand feature if you have a question. Uh, and that's at the bottom of your screen, by the chat, share screen, raise hand, and react buttons. Also, feel free if you like to type, if you're a fast typer, you can just type your question in the chat, and then Stuart will answer it for you. So here we are then. Uh, there's only so much you can do in um, just over an hour. So what I decided was to um, do the question and answers, get that out of the way, and then finish off the painting. So this is a few days later. Um, I don't know how many. What, uh, 28, 29, I don't know, it's about three or four days later. And um, the paint's dry. It's absolutely bone dry. None of this will come off. And um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to work over quite a lot of the sky that you see there. Some of it I'll probably keep, but um, quite a lot's going to get obliterated. But that doesn't matter. Everything, everything is fixable. So I've got phalo blue and um, Payne's grey and a glob of liquid. So I'm going to, first of all, fill up the areas I didn't paint, like over here, and darken this area up here. So let's start with the darkening. The question and answer session went very well. Um, that's really only only open to the um, Skype people. The way it works is. Um, with the lessons is that you can either pay the full fee, which I think is about 25 euros. Um, but if you're a patron, if you're a patron um, and you pay, I think it's $10 or more, um, you get the lessons free. Uh, and you also get the questions and answers. So, so it works quite well. And it's fun too. I quite enjoy chatting to people. And also, I like the um, slight element of surprise because you never really know what people are going to ask you. It can be, I mean, I know it's going to be to do with painting, but uh, maybe it'll be something I can't answer because I don't. I certainly don't know everything. Now then, um, the sky, let's see, 
while I was painting it, you may have noticed that I went around the tree with this slight cloud formation. I certainly don't want to do that. It's not something I would do normally. Um, so I'm going to change that quite dramatically. And I'm also just adding a little bit more darkness here. Just a little bit more, a little bit more threat in the sky. Now, what I, what I can also do is just take a little bit of dark across there. Now, I'm going over the tree that I've painted, as you can see. That's completely um, deliberate. And the reason I'm doing it is so that there is a continuation of the clouds behind the trees. The trees mustn't follow the landscape. The landscape, I beg your pardon, the sky mustn't follow the landscape. They are two separate entities. So, um, obviously, sky will go off and do its own thing. Okay, so there's a, a bit of own thing doing sky. Lot, quite a mess at the moment, but it doesn't matter. It's all part of the fun. Make the mess and then unravel it. Now, I think what I'm going to do here, I'm gonna, I've got some white there. Uh, this is just board, so I think I'll just obliterate that. Just get a tone on there. Very rattly. Okay, so there's a nice sort of reasonable covering of blue. It's nice and streaky and uh, it's got all different tones in it. Um, and that's exactly what I want. So I'm going to start playing with this stuff now. And the first thing I'll do is make it into a sort of flat pad, like so. That's because I want to just smear some of this to lose a few brush marks. Ordinarily, I would uh, be completely changing this paper. After it's got to that state, I would find a clean bit, but that's not the object of this part of the exercise. This is just a spread paint. It's not um, to lose brush marks. I'll lose some brush marks, obviously, uh, but um, it's going to stay patchy and blotchy, which is fine. Okay. And I'll be going over that with a big brush um, a little bit later. So, next thing is to get this. Nice big brush. And I'm going to just smooth it a little bit over the, over the blue. Not much, and you won't have seen much uh, actually happen to the painting. But um, it all builds up. So now, this is where gla this is how glazing works. If I get another piece of paper, clean piece, and I want to expose the tree because I've covered it in blue. Um, as Yoda would say, rocket science it is not. Just take off the paint like so and reveal what's underneath. Now this is interesting you see because these are both the same sort of strength of colour here. So there's not a lot of contrast between the tree and the blue. So I'll be working on that a little bit more in a moment. I'm going to just do um, a little bit of an experiment here. So, well, it's an ex sort of experiment. It's a piece of paper, as normal, um, and a bit of Payne's grey, just straight, almost straight from the tube. And I'm just going to put that here, because I want this to over this side of the painting. I want this to be dark and threatening and I'm going to add light this side. So I'm just going to put some Payne's Grey along here in a few places, really close to the horizon. There we go. In the bin. Oh yeah, that 
that's threatening. I wouldn't want to go for a walk over there. Well, that, or maybe I would actually. Off the beaten path has always interested me, I have to say. I might have mentioned this on um, one of my older videos, I'm not sure. As you get older, the memory does play tricks. <coughs> but, um, 20 years ago, just over, well, in fact, yeah, just over 20 years ago, I was sent by a magazine I worked for to um, Costa Rica to go and live in the jungle with some um, fee-paying volunteers. These people would pay to go to places, could be anywhere, uh, to work on a project, a scientific project. And the magazine I worked for, I was the art director on a magazine called Geographical. And they sent me to Costa Rica to uh, help and uh, also write an article and take photographs for a story on um, bugs. Uh, bugs and their predators in the forest canopy. Very interesting. Not to everyone. To me, though, it was interesting to me. So I lived in the jungle and um, for three weeks with these other, I think, 15 or 16 people. And uh, every day we would, pretty well every day, We'd go off into the jungle and um, empty these traps. Uh, trap by traps, I mean basically pieces of polythene pegged out on the floor of the jungle just to catch um, caterpillar poo. And apparently, they could tell by the amount of poo it per square meter how many, how many sort of. Well, I suppose how many caterpillars there are, and um, also what's the predator situation like. But anyway, that's beside the point. So I, one day, I decided that I would um, go off into the jungle and just sort of have a walk around and see if there's anything interesting to photograph. An interesting way of doing sky, this. Again, I'm not using a brush, by the way. It's just a, a piece of paper, a bit of white paint, and um, I'm just sort of doing some shapes. Anyway, I wandered off the beaten track, and um, I've never been known for my sense of direction. I've always said to people that, um, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not one of these guys that will say, yeah, leave it to me, I'll get us there. I mean, in the days before GPS in a car, if you went anywhere with me, it would be a mystery. First of all, where we're going, and would we ever get back? But anyway... Um, so off I went into this, into the bush, thinking that I would easily find my way back because I just sort of went in a straight line. But you know, knowing me, knowing me, I I got myself turned around, as they say, and I, I found something interesting on the way. Went wandered over to look at it, and then I thought, hang on a minute, this is not right. I'm not going the right direction. So I was lost for almost two hours, and it was getting to the point where I was thinking of um, shouting coming up with some idea of something to do anyway. But I didn't. I just kept walking around and round and I started marking the ground just to see if I went to the same place twice and I, funnily enough I didn't. Um, and I was lucky I found my way back and it was okay. So that was uh, so yeah. The beaten track is an interesting place. So there's a there's a, a, a little quick way of doing a few low lying um, clouds on the near to the horizon just as a, a little um a uh, little appetizer for you just wondering what to do next i think i might um i might introduce some white here so what i'll do and it's it's literally as loose as i'm doing it there's no there's no strain involved with this i'm just going to sort of i'm not even looking really i know the trees are going to come down this way and sort of go off in the distance there but i'm not too concerned about the um infinite detail of that the tops of those trees I'm just going to put some light in the sky there so that it works against the darkness of the tree just makes it a little bit more interesting a bit over bright at the moment but that's easily fixed you just get a clean piece of the paper and then just push it around a bit more so that you can soften it 
just a little bit and I'll be softening it even more in a second another piece of paper I can either soften it with a piece of paper like this like so or I can wait a few minutes do the most of the sky get my sky the way I want it and then I can put a bit of tree over this cloud to um, get the tree to feather into the sky a little bit so I'm going to I do use small brushes by the way um, but at the moment it just seems handy to use a piece of paper so I'm going to um, put some more low-lying cloud over there or should I say some low-lying blue and white paint that's giving the illusion of cloud okay so that's dropping too much there so I'm going to build that up don't want things dropping off the edge of your picture Try to try to have a nice uh, balance about the objects in your painting. So I'm going to do something up there, I think. And in a moment, I'll be using the palette knife to shovel a bit of white onto the painting because I want to do I want to do some nice streaky clouds, but I also want a few. Uh, cumulus as well so let's see what we can do so nice big lump of white paint on there and I think we'll just basically do that and what else should we do I think that needs taking up a little bit more like so Yeah, this is this is how I get the um, feeling of movement in my skies. Basically, try not to hesitate too much. Give it a little, um, a bit of pizzazz with your pizzazz with your paper. I might even put some red in there. Not sure yet. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, it's coming along. It's it's one of these things uh, I find with skies is that sometimes you can start a painting. It depends on the type of painter you are. You see, if you're a tonalist, a lot of what tonalists do is is highly imaginary. If you're a realist, um, you will find some clouds, and it may be a photograph, I suppose, or go out and look at some clouds. And, and literally copy it. I don't like doing that. I much prefer. Uh, I much prefer the clouds of my mind. I just find them a little bit more interesting. I'm going to get another big brush and do a little bit of skimming. The last, the other big brush I was using is a little bit, uh, bit clogged. So I'm going to use this one uh, which looks as though it has paint on it but it's just a stain uh, these bristles tend to hold the stains of the colors quite um, quite permanently okay so don't forget what I said about how you do this it's the side so you have to turn the brush this way and that way and I go in all directions so I imagine I'm doing a like a cross this way and then diagonals extremely light touch otherwise it will suddenly be lost and you will just end up with something that appears to have no um, no definition I suppose you know I like I like these little light areas that stick out up here and up there the contrasts are the things that make it interesting now these clouds along here I mean I could probably leave them but I'm not over 
over happy with them. So what I'm going to do um, is just basically make a mess of them a little bit and see what I can, see what I can come up with. Whoops. See what I can come up with. Just like so. I mean, I don't mind a hint of a bit of nimbus, but uh, and I've painted some nimbuses. <laughs> Or was it Nimbai? I painted lots of Nimbai in my time. But I like this, as I said. I like this sort of the freeness that you get using this method. Ooh, while I'm here, while I've got you here, I'd just like to say thank you uh, to the people who come to my YouTube channel. I recently broke the um, 100,000 subscriber barrier and believe me, if you're, if you're not, um, I have nothing against young trendy people, Some very nice young trendy people around, um, but it, it sort of seems that most of the really popular YouTube channels are um, run by young trendy people. I am neither young nor trendy. In fact, I'm not afraid to admit it. Uh, the, today, I think, is the. What is the date today? It's probably the 1st of February. So, in 22 days, I'll be 69. So, I'm, not, I'm certainly not young. And I never was particularly trendy, funnily enough. But anyway, uh, what I'm trying to say in my clumsy way here is thank you for all of those of you who have uh, subscribed to my channel and also the ones who keep coming back to look at what I'm uh, uploading. It's, uh, it's, I find YouTube very exciting. I think it's an amazing adventure for those people who can make it work, but not just the not just the creators. Um, it, it's such a mine of information. Um, some people say that there are all kinds of biases. There's certain things you can't do and say on YouTube. You know, but um, I'm not going to really get into that. But I guess because I'm just doing painting, so I'm not going to do anything controversial. But um, I think it's. I think I really enjoy it. I enjoy the apart from the creative process of painting, uh, I just like YouTube. I haven't actually owned a television for well over 20 years. And uh, I don't think I um, will ever own a television again, I think. It's just, I find this much more, YouTube is much more, um, I'd like to say it, uh, you have more variety because let's face it, you, you can wake up, as somebody once said, and I thought this was funny, you can wake up at two in the morning, get on your computer and type in, do penguins have knees? And you'll have the answer. Um, I think it's, uh, it's good fun. And apparently they do have knees, they just go the other way. Okay, so this is, this is going, in the direction that I wanted it to go. This has sort of become interesting here. Without, without any kind of sweat, it's, it's quite easy. It's, the thing is, don't be precise, be loose, put, chuck the paint on and just wait and see what happens. I'm quite happy with what's going on in there. I'm probably going to do a little bit of work on the foreground and then I think that's the end of the painting. Um, and um, Well, a bit of work on the foreground possibly the edges of the trees. I don't know, maybe I'll keep it slightly feathery. I wonder. I'll let you know either way in a moment. Let's put some blue on that and just see what happens there. It's the great, one of the great things about tonalism. It's just, just fiddle with it, see what happens. Sometimes it'll be good, sometimes it won't be so good. If it isn't so good, just take it off, have another go. Now that is, that is, I like this. That's exciting my my brain nodules that's sort of I don't know something going on in there I find a little bit mystical 
and I like that. Adding a bit of blue to the green of the tree there, why not? That's cool. Will I even do anything to the foreground? Do I need to do anything? I wonder. Maybe what I'll do is just upload this now and leave it to you. You let me know what you think. I get lots of comments and as I always say, I like that, I like the comments. Be polite, because if you're not, I'll just um, delete you, you'll never see me again. So if, if my paintings or my painting style or anything about me offends you don't worry I'll take care of that for you I'll just vanish from your life so um, or instead of writing something rude you can just move on it's what grown-ups do okay so I'm toying with the idea of just getting a bit of white on these tree trunks just to bring them out a little bit I've got this I've got this shape here this sort of shrubbery thing and I've got one there and they they are there to try and get the viewer to look between these things so I want people first of all to go in there and get trapped then I want them to look at the sky if their eye goes up here chances are it'll come down there and then it'll look at this and then because that's dark the eye will want to go to light so it'll come along here that's my plan so the next thing I'm going to do is zoom in a bit for you and then I'll just do a little bit of tickling with um, a very small brush called a rigger and then I think we'll call it a day on this particular painting so here's my rigger very very thin long bristled brush if you want to do any fine line work this is the best sort of brush you can get because it holds enough paint for you to get a nice long line if you're painting a line um, and it's and it's called a rigger because they were used for painting rigging on ships in paintings um, if you use a tiny brush with hardly any bristles like just a little tiny you know stumpy thing there uh, all you'll be doing is painting dots because they won't hold enough paint to paint lines so that's something to bear in mind so let's zoom in for you probably enough I think now there is no detail in these trees they are if you're watching the video earlier which hopefully you were to get to this stage these are just literally scraped into the paint and um, sometimes that's okay just to leave it like that however you're here to learn something so I'm going to show you a little thing or two well the, the color that I'm going to put on these trees won't actually be white it's going to be a tiny um, it's going to be slightly off white but it's so so small uh, it'll probably register as white so all I'm going to do is just put a few let me just check that I've got my ugly mug in the way okay a few little light spots on these trees like that one and I think a bit more there and I think even a fine line coming across and then down to there just just enough to um, plant a bit of interest in that area so let's have another one there with a nice angled line so I'm just literally what I'm doing is painting over the marks that I left uh, when I scraped the paint. Let's have another line coming down there. Like so. Yep. And I'm um, just going to get a bit more liquid. If I can do this without spilling the stuff. As I showed you earlier, it's a great big can, liquid original. This is Winsor & Newton. Um, this is not uh, product placement, they're not paying me. 
no, no, I don't do any of that uh, product placement stuff. Um, I think if, if, if I was approached, I might be up for it, but at the moment I don't. I only use uh, products that I like. And quite frankly, um, if I don't like the project product, I won't promote it. Where would be the point? Okay, so a little bit more light just there. And a bit through there, through the tree, a tiny little hint of it at the top there. Just enough to tell the eye that whatever's down here is going up, up there. And you can then do a few, a few marks again, which will just give the eye enough info to say something is going on here and you need to look at it like so. So I think another tiny bit just catching that just there. And what else? Let me just see. Okay, let's have them. Um, I think maybe, I think one or two really thin ones over here. What I do, by the way, to get uh, ultra thin lines like that is you can use a stick, you know, a ma what's called a marl stick, which is basically a, like a piece of wooden doweling with um, a bundle of cloth on the end, and you lean it to, you know, you just lean against the picture. Because this is basically bone dry, what I do is I use my little finger and I just, even if this was wet, I could still do it here. Um, I just literally put my little finger on there to support my arm because I'm standing at a really strange angle here at the moment to, so to do this. Um, so that uh, it, it means that it takes away some of the wobble. There we are. Let's have a little bit of strength just down there. And I think we're pretty well there on this now. Just spotted a hair that can come off. The only thing I'm going to do right over here in the distance is just put, for, for the heck of it, no, no real reason, just what I would call undrawn detail. Just something over there catching a bit of light. So you can go down here, whoops, move the camera, I'm just going to swivel you slightly. Okay, so what I like to do in my painting sometimes is have little mystery spots. So if you were standing here looking at this view, you could say, oh, I wonder what's down there. You know, there's like a, there's somewhere to go and then it's blocked off by this tree. So there's a bit of a mystery down there. And to bring it to even slightly more of a mystery, just put a little light spot to catch the eye. Now, what I've done there, I've done this deliberately, it's got a pointed end here. If I just thicken that end slightly, like that, okay, uh, it looks as though it's painted on. And the reason um, it looks like that is because it is. What I'm going to do is just blunten it like so. Now it looks as though it's going behind those trees. I think I think we're pretty well there. The only thing I might do, just because I'm me, is um, just sp sp spread that a little bit. I think we're there. I think that'll do for this one. So anyway, this was um, this was lesson number. Was this lesson number one? I think this was lesson number one on Skype. Uh, I've had a second lesson since uh, since I made this one, and it's um, a tree. It's a painting of a tree, and I'll just put on the screen uh, the stage that I got to, which is this, and. What I'll be doing in my next video is, because this has already been a lesson, I'll be finishing this off and um, a similar sort of thing to this, you know, how to put on, how to put on glazes, how to make a, a painting more interesting and more finished.
So there we are. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you'll come back for more. And please leave a comment, uh, ask me questions. And um, if you want to get on to uh, one of my Skype lessons, I will, you'll probably need to go to my Facebook page. Although if I do get, uh, if I do get the information ready um, soon, I'll put it in the info box below this video. And um, let's uh, meet up sometime and paint a picture. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye for now.